Hello and welcome to Tech Deals. Which NVMe SSD drive should you buy? We have eight different drives today compared benchmarks and specific purchase recommendations from low-end budget drives all the way to the premium Samsung 970 Evo Plus. Which should you buy? We're going to get into that today. All the drives discussed today will be linked in the video description below to Amazon and Newegg. If you like this content, please consider supporting by using those links when shopping. Also, remember to subscribe, like, and leave a comment below because YouTube engagement is a thing. Ten years ago, almost nobody was using a solid state drive of any kind. They were small and expensive. Five years ago, they started to become mainstream for enthusiast computers, starting with excellent drives like the Samsung 8. 40 Evo, which I had in my Haswell machine. And then two years ago, I did two SSD comparison videos, one for serial ATA drives and one for the then relatively new and more expensive NVMe drives. At the time, back in 2017, my advice for most people was to save your money and get a SATA drive. The NVMe drives at the time were not worth the price premium for most people. That was then, and this is now. NVMe drives have now reached price parity or close enough that it doesn't matter for most people to SATA drives that NVMe has become the new recommendation. There's still about a 20% price premium, but considering the performance, that's not a lot to pay for substantially more than 20% more performance. SATA drives still have a place either for game drives, secondary storage, or to give older PCs a new lease on life. If you've never stuck an SSD into an older computer, it can make a five or even 10 year old computer feel like new if it was previously running a hard drive. But if you're building a new machine today, if you've got a Ryzen or one of the latest Intel core chips, then NVMe is where it's at. NVMe stands for Non-Volatile Memory Express, which is a really fancy way of saying flash storage via the PCI Express bus. These are literally PCI Express expansion cards in an M.2 format as opposed to something that slides into what you would traditionally think to be an expansion slot. They are X4 or four lanes each. Now, the NVMe standard is a protocol. It's the M.2 slot is separate from NVMe. It's just what NVMe happens to use most of the time. Many people think of SATA drives as being two and a half inch drives and NVMe as being M.2, but that's not always true. SATA is also an interface. Most SATA drives, most modern SATA drives use AHCI, Advanced Host Configuration Interface. You don't have to remember this. I promise there will be no quiz on this tomorrow, but it's important to understand that AHCI drives can be had in the M.2 format and NVMe drives can be had in the two and a half inch format. That is what the U.2 standard was, which nobody adopted and it's mostly gone at this point, but those do exist or a couple of them do in any case. This right here is a really good example of that. This is two M.2 drives on an expansion card. One is SATA and one is NVMe. So you can have both drives in the same format. We today are only talking about NVMe and frankly, at today's prices, that's what you should be buying. Here's the really short version without all the technical jargon. NVMe is superior in every way to AHCI, which you otherwise know as SATA, the only reason it wasn't used for hard drives was because they wouldn't have taken advantage of it. NAND, with its much faster random access, takes advantage of the superior NVMe protocol, which is why it's being used for SSDs. The old interface was designed for hard drives, and frankly, it never was really that great for SSDs, but we have NVMe now, and so life moves on. A common question is, how large of a drive should I buy? Well, it wasn't that long ago that 256 gigabyte SSDs were standard and anything bigger was considered monstrous, but those days are over. You can now buy one terabyte of NVMe super fast storage for right around $100. At that price point, I genuinely don't think that most people should buy smaller than a one terabyte drive for a primary use daily computer. A secondary machine, a backup computer, something that isn't used very much, sure, can absolutely have a smaller drive. But if it's going to be your daily driver, something that you use every day that you have games and apps and programs installed in, one terabyte is where it's at, even for sub $1,000 computers. 
because your boot drive is one of the hardest things to upgrade. It's the biggest pain in the neck to change. And so many programs, apps, updates, games, drivers, and everything else want to be on your C drive, it's simply easier to have room there to grow. It is also worth noting that unlike hard drives, to a large extent, SSDs get faster and have better endurance the larger they get. One terabyte drives are generally a bit faster than the 500 gig versions. They generally have double the total write life because SSDs do have a limited life, although it's not a factor for most people. And you generally have a better overall experience. There's a larger buffer, a larger cache. Some of these drives actually have better onboard processors than their 500 uh, gigabyte and their 250 gigabyte versions. So now that they're down to $100, get the one terabyte version unless you are very, very budget strapped. Two terabytes is not crazy, but we'll talk about that in a minute. One more thought regarding drive size. Games are getting bigger and bigger, and with streaming textures and 4K textures, they just continue to get larger in size, and the stutter in games loading off the hard drive is a real thing. It's not a huge thing, but if you don't like micro stuttering in your games, especially open world games or fast paced games or games that change their maps often, then you want to install your modern games on an SSD. Otherwise, you get those little texture pop-ins and delays and load times that are just a little bit annoying in your modern game. As for size, Call of Duty Black Ops 4 is now 140 gigabytes in size. Even GTA 5, which is now a five-year-old game, has ballooned to over 80 gigabytes in size, and half of the games that I regularly benchmark are pushing 100 terabytes each. If you need any further evidence that one terabyte should be the new minimum amount of space that you buy for your boot drive, not to mention your game and data drive, I think that pretty much sums it up in my opinion. To actually boot your system to an NVMe drive, you must have native support built right into your motherboard. Intel started supporting NVMe with the fourth generation of processors, Haswell, in 2014 with the 90 series of boards. The Z97 boards usually had one M.2 slot on it, although they were not full speed slots. It does not matter. I know because I have an NVMe drive installed on my Z97 on my i7-4790K. It was the Z170 boards when they became full speed uh, slots. They're quite a bit slower for those older ones, but it really doesn't matter. Anything newer should also have an M.2 slot on it. AMD started supporting NVMe with Ryzen in 2017. Better late than never, but it's fine because the older chips are FX and I benchmarked those and well, we won't talk about those anymore. But if you do have an older system and you want to add storage and you don't want to put a two and a half inch SSD in, a SATA drive, either you don't have a power cable, another data cable, another port, or you want to be future proof. Perhaps you want to add another SSD to your system now and you want to make it your boot drive when you upgrade your system at some point in the future. Not to worry, for under $15, you can buy one of these cards. This is a PCI Express 4X card to a M.2 slot, because an M.2 slot is just four PCI Express lanes. That's why these are under $15. It is a straight adapter to adapt the wires to your board. You can install this in almost anything. A 10-year-old i7-920 will take this and you will be able to use it as a data drive. Not a boot drive, but a data drive. So buy yourself a nice new M.2 NVMe SSD, put it in one of these, put it in your old system, use it for a while, and when you upgrade, you can take it off and make it the boot drive of whatever you upgrade to. Another advantage of that card for any system is the fact that it makes installation so much simpler. With a two and a half inch drive, you need a power cable from your power supply and a SATA data cable and a port on your motherboard. You need four drive screws, a place in your system to put it, and you have to do cable management. With a card, insert the card, put the drive on, you're done. There's no power cable, there's no data cable. It takes a minute to install and it's very, very simple. Even if you have an older system, even if you have like an i5-2400 with PCI Express 2, yes, it's gonna run at technically half speed, but for that, you're gonna put a budget drive on and it really isn't going to matter. Even if you've got a seven, eight, or nine-year-old computer, if you wanna add storage, that's a really easy way to do it if you have a PCI Express 4X slot or larger to put it in. Finally, last but not least, a very common question is, what is the difference between SLC, MLC, TLC, and QLC? I'm gonna talk about these a little bit in the benchmarks, which we are getting to right after this part. However, 
That is a common question where people often misunderstand what they mean or misunderstand how important they are or are not. So here's the really, really short version. SLC is one bit per NAND memory cell. MLC is two bits per NAND memory cell. TLC is three and QLC is four. It actually gets exponentially more difficult with the voltage levels and the technology, which we're not gonna get into, but QLC is substantially harder to do than even TLC. However, you get much more storage for the money, which is why the drive manufacturers do it. None of these drives are primary SLC drives. We have not had SLC drives for a long time. Very early NAND was, but they went to MLC very quickly. Most of these drives are TLC, tri-level cell, three bits per cell, and two of them are QLC, the Intel 660P and the Samsung P1. They are natively slower. However, all of these drives use some form of buffering or cache, which is why you're gonna see the excellent write performance in random, as opposed to read speeds, but we'll talk about that during the benchmarks, they use some form of cache. The Intel 660P, for example, sets aside part of its NAND memory as SLC or single level cell, sit so one bit per cell. How much depends upon what size drive you buy and how full it is, because it shrinks a bit as the drive gets full. But what it does is it uses that to buffer incoming writes and it gets great performance, though read speed and the write speed to the SLC cache is spectacular. The actual native speed to the QLC memory on those is not actually all that great. However, unless you plan on writing hundreds of gigabytes regularly to the drive without giving it a break, it doesn't matter and you will never notice. Planning on writing 10, 20, or 30 gigabytes, it's not an issue. It's only when you try to do full drive writes that it becomes an issue. If you do plan to do huge amounts of writes on a regular basis, well then yeah, it's probably not the ideal drive. You might wanna pick one of the others. But in the real world, the SLC cache masks it for the most part. Even the TLC of the other drives is really not as fast as the benchmark numbers might otherwise indicate because they either have DRAM buffers or some SLC cache of their own, although it's smaller than the QLC drives, in order to buffer incoming, especially random writes, to pick up and improve performance. A good example of a true MLC drive is the Samsung 970 Pro. These are expensive. This is a true two bit per cell and this will write at its full sustained speed for the entire drive. You don't need this most likely, maybe like half of a percentage point of you do. The 970 Evo is a TLC drive and it will not write its full drive length at full speed. It will eventually start to slow down. Although not that much, it has ex Samsung makes spectacular drives. They're expensive, but that's still a really, really good drive. Now I actually have this specific drive in my Threadripper machine, which is my primary content creation machine for YouTube. I, and I use it intensively, which is why I have a pro drive in there. But unless you're doing 4K 60 video for a living, like I am, you probably don't need one of these expensive pro drives. There's also total drive write life to consider, which kind of carries into the type of NAND on here. And this is something that many people bring up as a concern. It's really not. Don't worry about how much write life the drives have unless you intentionally abuse your machine. And if you haven't heard of it, by the way, all NAND wears out eventually. Unlike hard drives, the NAND memory cells have a fixed number of writes that they can take. But all of these drives have spare area set aside and wear levelers, the controllers on board, uh, spread out the writes throughout the NAND to, to basically even out the wear of the drives. These will become obsolete before you wear them out. I've owned SSD since 2010 for nine years. I still have my original drives from 2010. One of them is installed in one of my machines downstairs. None of my drives have used up more than 10% of their total drive write life. Most of my drives are at 98 or 97% total drive write remaining. So if you're worried about it, rest assured it really isn't as big of a deal. It just sounds scary, but it really isn't. Well, that's enough of me talking. Let's get to the benchmarks. Let's start off with sequential and then we'll get to random performance. First up, we have the sequential read and write numbers. These are the big crowd pleasing numbers where we go, whoa, look at this three and a half gigabytes per second. We are super speed now. Compared to the 500 to 550 megabytes per second, 
these are substantially faster transfer rates. Well, at least for some of the drives, you'll notice right away that the QLC drives, the Crucial P1 and the Intel 660P are noticeably slower. And oddly enough, the sequential write speed of the Intel 760P is half of all the other drives. But effectively, as much as it doesn't make any difference, the sequential read and sequential write speed of the other standard TLC drives, the ADATA, AdLink, Sembert Rocket, uh, the Samsung 970 EVO Plus, and then the Western Digital Black SN750, who comes up with these names, are all effectively between three and three and a half gigabytes per second. It looks really impressive. However, Unless you're doing direct file copies from one identical drive to another identical drive, are you really going to see this transfer rate that often? And does it actually matter in day-to-day -day use? That's a subjective question, although it can be looked at based upon loading times and launch times and application install times and other sorts of tasks. I've used enough of these drives in daily use to tell you, yes, random is what matters more than sequential. Here are some random read and write speeds. Still very impressive performance, but naturally quite a bit lower. This is where we get into the nitty gritty of actual normal desktop user experience. This is Q depth of eight, thread count of eight. This is not a normal workload. This is not what you're gonna see on a single user desktop, running a few programs, having a web browser open, watching a video, playing a game. This is intense, high demand, high workload activity. It makes the numbers really impressive. It really lets the drives multiple controllers, uh, multiple uh, data channels really get that throughput up. But seriously, this is not what you're going to expect on a day-to-day -day basis. Now, this is much more interesting. We've increased the queued up to 32, but lowered the thread count to one. In other words, one person is doing something. And yes, you might get a thread count of two if two different programs are accessing something. But in general, this is more indicative of a high demand workload being placed on these drives by a single program. What we're looking at here is a very consistent level of performance across the board. Roughly 500 megabyte per second random read speed and roughly 400 to 500 megabyte per second random write speed. Notice all of the differences went away when we took away the thread count. Let's see what happens when we take away the Q depth count. And there went our beautiful performance numbers. This is much more realistic and real world, and you're never going to see the drive companies advertise it because these numbers don't look pretty on the box or the packaging or the advertising or whatever you're looking at. We're looking at a low of 45 megabyte per second on the Western Digital Black for random read, and we're looking at a high of about 146 for random write speed. Now the random write speed is higher because all of these drives have some form of buffer, some sort of cache, either a DRAM cache or they have S a small amount of SLC high speed uh, NAND that's faster than the, than the rest of the drive that allows them to buffer incoming writes. So random writes coming in out of order, the drive can take, store in the buffer, rearrange, and then write out to the drive, which is why the random write speed is so much faster than the random read speed. Notice that even the spectacular Samsung 970 EVO Plus only does 65 megabytes per second random read compared to the lowest drives on here, the Sembrant Rocket, the AdLink S70, and believe it or not, the Western Digital Black SN750, that new drive, which I was kind of disappointed with for how much they charge for that. These are all real differences. There, there is a legitimate difference between, say, the Samsung and the Sembrant Rocket, but will you really notice it in the real world? Maybe if you're doing intensive tasks. If you're installing one of these drives in a high-end desktop, sure, maybe. But the truth of the matter is, any NVMe drive is going to be better than any SATA drive for normal consumer workloads on the desktop. It's not going to make a substantial difference which drive you buy, except to your wallet. And the wallet is the one place where I think we really need to take a closer look at. So let's do just that. Here's the price per gigabyte of each of these drives. Is the Samsung 970 EVO Plus the best? Yes, and if you just won the lottery last night, why are you watching this? Go buy that drive, it's amazing. However, 
The Sambrant Rocket is exactly 50% the price of the 970 EVO Plus, and it's really close in performance. It's not perfect, it's not quite there, it's a little bit lower here and there, and Samsung does have the benefit of a longer warranty, better endurance, and better tools. The Samsung Magician software and the Samsung cloning software are excellent. If you've got the budget for it, rock on and get the Samsung. They're wonderful, wonderful drives. But you can buy two terabytes of some of these drives for the price of one terabyte of the Samsung. I have mentioned the Crucial P1 and the Intel 660P before. They are great drives. And if you prefer to buy from name brands, Crucial's owned by Micron and everybody knows who Intel is, those are great drives with great warranties and great companies standing behind them. But in terms of performance, the Sambrant Rocket is actually the winner here. The ADATA SX8200 Pro is pretty close. If its price were just a touch lower, it would be the winner here because ADATA is a bigger company and more well-known. And the Adlink S70 is fine in and of its own right. The Intel 760P is a nice drive, but it just costs too much for what it is in my opinion. And I'm really disappointed in that Western Digital Black. And one final look, perhaps this is helpful to you. You've got to be on a decent sized monitor to read it, but I put four of these charts up in quadrants so that you can see them all at the same time and look back and forth at the numbers and compare them. I did leave off the QDEP32 thread count of one because frankly, there was virtually no difference across the board between any of the drives. So instead, I'm just showing you these four. I will link to all of this down below, but in my opinion, the Sambrant Rocket, the Intel 660P, the Crucial P1, and if you want a more performance-oriented drive, the ADATA SX8200 Pro are all worth considering. But frankly, you could put any of these drives in your computer and they would all provide wonderful performance and probably be far, far faster than anything you currently have. In short, buy based upon price. You could put any of these drives into your modern build and most likely you would be wowed and love the experience. And frankly, unless you put them all side by side together and test them back to back, you'd never notice the difference. In fact, even using them myself, it is hard to tell the difference in normal desktop user workloads. It is worth noting that I do have a pro drive as my boot drive on my Threadripper, my primary content creation machine, this gets a heavy, heavy workout because I make 4K 60 frame per second videos for a living on YouTube. However, for my actual video files that I am editing, I use four Intel 660p 2 terabyte NVMe drives on an ASUS M.2 HyperCard on my Threadripper. These are in RAID 0. That gives me eight terabytes of scratch storage space. This is not archived. This is what I work with. This video that I am recording right now will be copied to that array. And that's where I do my editing and my cutting and trimming in Adobe Premiere Pro. And I have multiple projects in progress at any one time and recorded benchmark footage. And I put everything together and I also just render out to it. I used to render to a separate drive and discovered it didn't really make any difference because four of these have plenty of performance for that kind of thing. It is also worth noting that as nice as the 970 EVO Plus is, it is over $200 at the time of this recording for a one terabyte 970 EVO Plus. It is less than $200 for a two terabyte 660p. That is double the storage for less money. And in the real world, 95% of you will never notice the difference between those two drives. The Samsung is a bit nicer to be sure but eight terabytes of the Samsung would be hellaciously expensive. It's really not that bad to get eight terabytes of this if you're a professional content creator. So before you think you have to buy the best, consider the value of some of these less expensive drives. Now, I was impressed with drives like the Sambient Rocket and the Adlink drive. They really performed remarkably well for their price. At the time of recording, and prices change, which is why everything is linked in the video description below. At the time of recording, the Sambrant Rocket was half the price, or $110, versus the $220 of the Samsung. And the performance is really, really good. The only downside is a shorter warranty and a company you've never heard of, as opposed to Intel or Crucial. Crucial's owned by Micron, it's their consumer division, which you know they're gonna be around for the next five years. In fact, the Intel has a spectacular warranty. So which one you want really is a personal preference. You wouldn't go wrong with either one of them, quite frankly. If you want more mid-range performance, as I mentioned during the benchmarks, the SX8200 Pro is very competitive performance-wise. Not quite as fast as the Samsung, 
but it's pretty close and it can be had for under $150 at the time of this recording for the one terabyte size. So that's pretty impressive. Choices are awesome. As always, questions, comments, thoughts, feedback, suggestions, that's what the comment section is for below. Hopefully you're all subscribed and you've hit that bell notification icon because those things help with the performance of the video. And if you click that, you'll actually get notified when new videos come out. Check the links in the video description, as I've mentioned, that all of these drives are linked down there. Using those links doesn't cost you anything extra and it does support the channel, whatever you happen to buy it makes no difference, but they'll all be linked down there. As I mentioned, the one terabyte size is the smallest most people should consider. I do love the fact that two terabyte 660Ps are available for under $200. That's amazing when you consider the historical price of SSDs. Regardless, I hope this was helpful, useful, informative, entertaining, or amusing. Appreciate you all watching, and I will see you next time.